between here and the next church, I will. Those watching online, thanks for tuning in today. It's good to have folks. Well, we got a lot of folks that are watching today uh, because they, they can't get out, and uh, maybe they got a little electricity to charge the phone. It's funny. You, there's a lot of things that, that you are uh, going to take care of when you got a generator, and one of them is charging your phone because you can do so much now on your phone. Psalm 68. Are you comfortable? Psalms chapter 68, verse 4. This is what we did this morning. Sing to God. That's what the scripture says. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Lift him up. Extol him who rides on the clouds. People ask me at times, what does holy wild mean? And I say, well, God's holy and he's wild. He creates man in the wilderness the scripture says he rides on clouds. I want you to think of that. You don't realize how fast clouds are moving, but they are moving, man. They're moving faster than your jets that are in the air. And God surfs on them and rides on the clouds. Amen. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. When I found that scripture, it affected me so deeply because you can be in a crowd and be lonely. You can be in your family and be lonely. But when God puts you with his family, you know, I have a few biological family members, but my family, the family I look toward, is the family of God, my brothers and my sisters. He sets the lone. He leads out the prisoners with singing. I was incarcerated for a little while for doing a little protesting, righteous protesting, not this nonsense I've been seeing, this standing up for the unborn. When I got out of jail, I sang. When I was in jail, I sang. But, boy, I really sang when I got out. Amen. I mean, I, I, I extolled his name. I lifted him up. Hallelujah. Amen. And some of those prisoners that were in jail with me got saved and born again. It was an amazing time. I appreciate your tax money again. <laughs> but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you're rebellious against God, when you stand against the Father, amen, uh, you know, listen, your, your life is going to be sun-scorched is uh, to get sunburned and above. To keep just keep getting burned. I mean, that's what it is. And the land cannot grow uh, vegetation. That's what he's saying here. So I love this passage out of Psalms. Uh, I want to pick up this part here where it says he sets the lonely in families. He sets the, the lonely families. Oh, let me read it, correct it. God sets the lonely in families. This is the family of God, the house of God, and this is where he puts us. Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. I need your help this morning. Don't need to be scattered. Got a lot to share. I love, I love your book. Oh, you gave us a cool book. 66 books thrown into one. They all connect. They all share your love for humanity. And some of it is so personal to me in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Everybody needs a home. There's nothing like that feeling of a long uh, away, away, and then you get home. Uh, a week or so ago, we took a ride to go see my, my mother in Alabama, and it was 750 miles to get there on a motorcycle, 750 miles. Jacob, I want you to hear this. 750 miles there, 750 miles back in three days. Okay, so the middle day was a little rest, two days. From, but when I come back into that garage, that little opening, when I slid back up in there, Marie, and I, and I lifted what was left of my gluteus maximus <laughs> off of that motorcycle seat, I stared at, over across the road at my home, and I said to myself, home, sweet, home. There's nothing like home. Can I get an amen? When you get home, it's just, there's comfort in your bed. Amen. There's comfort in your cabinets. There's comfort in your refrigerator. There's comfort with petting your dogs. There's comfort in hugging your family. Amen. Just to get back home is a wonderful place to be. And that's how I feel on Sunday mornings and, and those midweek services and those special times when we get to get together as a church. Can I get an amen? Amen. We get together as a family. Everybody needs a home, a place where they're nurtured 
nurtured, loved, fed, a place of security and rest, a place where you are accepted and wanted. You know, that's why an orphanage is called a children's home. When you have to, when you, and I've met people that were raised up in orphanages. Well, David Clowers, who was here for eight and a half years, talked with David this week in Oklahoma. He said he got alerts on his phone in Oklahoma about what was going on in Houston. Amen. That's how bad. We made national news. I was getting messages from, Mike Warnke sent me a message from California. How you doing? He calls me white. I call him Virgil. It's a long story. But getting back to what's going on here, uh, an orphanage, if you were brought up in an orphanage, by 18 years of age, you are removed from that home. And everybody that's in that home becomes like a brother and sister to you, and those taking care of it comes like a mom and a dad. But you were removed at 18 never to get to go back. It's over with. They kick you out. You have to go make, you got to figure this thing out now. In our lives, if you've got a home, if you've got family, after 18 doesn't mean you leaving home. It means that you may have left, but you also get a chance to come back. Yesterday, I looked up on our property as I was mowing grass. My son, 24 years old, I ain't seen him since the flood. He, Judah, come back to the ranch. Came right up, gave his daddy a hug, you know, loved it. It was just like everything was good again. He had to take care of some business while he was there. But I, I thank God that you can come back. Say it. You can come back. Amen. Because that's a great place to be. We also need a church home, some place we can come back to. When I look at Scripture and I read stories over and over in, in, the, in the Bible, Judges chapter 20, you're going to find a story about the time that the rest of Israel went out to war with the tribes. Remember, there are 12 tribes of Israel. But those 12 brothers didn't always get along. Sometimes them tribes rose up against one another. There was one tribe known as the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was a tribe that could sling a stone right hand or left hand. They're a powerful bunch. They're ravenous wolves. They, 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 they're the guys you want to hang out with, the Benjamites. I mean, they're, they're tough. I'm going to show you how tough they are. That tribe of Benjamin had 26,000 men in, in the book of Judges. I ain't got time to read it all to you. But they fought against 400,000 from the rest of Israel. 26,000 against 400,000. Amazing. Amazing. Amen. The battle took place in a city called Gilba. Amen. On the first two days, Benjamin easily won the battle, killing 22,000 the first day, 18,000 the second day. He took out 40,000 uh, of the other Israelites. And on the third day, Israel had a plan. Some of the Israelites hid, and when Benjamin came out of the city, and began to fight Israel, the ones in hiding went into the city and set it on fire. Judges chapter 20, verse 40 records, but when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and there was the whole city going up in smoke in heaven. Verse 41, and when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked, for they saw that disaster had come unto them. So what happened, the Benjamites went out to fight. They knew they were going to win. The Israelites snuck in behind them, burned their homes. When you have no home to go back to, depression sets in. Aggravation sets in. You feel like you're defeated, and they were. At that moment, it was over for them. Because they had no home. How important is a home? Let me tell you about somebody else. If I say Shimei. Oh, man, I'm reading this story, and I'm, 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 re I mean, I'm just starting to go through Scripture again and, and enjoying the life of David. And, and I'm reading about this man, Shimei. He was of the family of Saul. Saul's the old king, the king that had actually took his own life in a chariot. Jonathan, his son, had also died in battle, which was David's best friend. David is now the king. i got to get you caught up. Here's what... I don't want to be too fast on this, but you need to read your scriptures. Get into 1st and 2nd Samuel and read about the life of David and, and how it all. Eventually, I'm going to preach on Ahithophel. I want, I want to lay some things out before you, but you need to know first. You remember we talked a couple of weeks ago on David, how he became king and how a young man named Samuel. Pastor Joseph last week preached on Hannah. Hannah had a little boy named Samuel. Samuel was raised up with Eli. Samuel later became the great prophet. Samuel said things. God did it. Samuel laid hands on and poured oil on little David. David became king. David waited until after Saul died. He would not take Saul's. He wouldn't take. He could have. He could have killed Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. I mean, oh, somebody wants to kill you. It's okay to kill them back. You just got to kill them before you're killed. Some of you will get that later. So David had opportunity over and over again to take out King Saul, but he wouldn't do it. Now Saul is dead. 
And Shimei is from that family. He's a part of the family. He's a member of the family. So the Bible says as King David approached Burham, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed David. Amen. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, started throwing rocks at him. How I many know David was a pretty good rock thrower himself? How I many know David could have popped him and knocked him out right there? He could have took him out with a sling and a stone. But he, he began to pelt him. And though all the troops and the special guards were on David's right and left, as he cursed, as he cursed, Shimei said, Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 9. Then Abishag, that's one of David's mighty men, son of Zeruel, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Please let me go over and take Take his head. I mean, this is what's going on. So this guy's throwing rocks at David. He's kicking dirt on David. He's calling him an SOB. Amen. He's getting all up in his face and stuff. And then David, David wouldn't let him. A few chapters later, we see that Shimei became a supporter of David. He voted for him now. <laughs> and asked his forgiveness for cursing him. So what happened to Shimei? First Kings chapter 2, verse 8. The scripture says, you see, you have, this is David giving instruction to the new king, Solomon, who is Bathsheba's son. So he's telling Solomon, now that he's king, David's getting old. He's transitioning. He's sliding on off the scene. And he says to him, you see, you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to uh, somewhere. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, Solomon, and you know what you ought to do to him. But bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. So David says to Solomon, I I'm dying, but there's one thing I want you to deal with as I go. Do you remember that shimmy I fell that threw rocks at me? and cursed me, and called me names. I want you to deal with him. Now watch what happens. First Kings chapter 2. Then the king Solomon sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there. And do not leave that house or go anywhere. For it's going to be on the day that you leave that house and you cross the brook, the brook Kidron. Know that certain you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. In other words, I'm going to give you a choice, Shimei. You can either stay in the home, Stay in your house, or you can come out and die. Hmm. So Shimei lived there for a while, and then he had some slaves that run off. So he takes off to Gath to go get his slaves. How many of you got slaves, you got other people that can go get them for you? But no, he leaves his house, he takes off, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 39. But three years later, two of Shimei's slaves ran off to Achish, son of Micah. That's it, there in Gath where Goliath was from, and Shimei was told, your slaves are in Gath. If only Shimei had stayed in the house. Because if you keep reading, Benaiah, another great man of God, went after him and took him out and killed him. Somebody say, stay in the house. Oh, Shimei left, got himself in. Everybody needs a home. Everybody needs to stay. When God says stay, there's something about the house of God. I'm going to break this down for you in just a minute. A place where they're nurtured, loved, fed, Safety, rest, place where you are accepted, wanted, and the little country church. God hit a reset inside me last night somewhere because I woke up with this passion to reach people and go after folk. And it, it, man, that's, I, don't, I don't mean this mean, but I ain't after church folk. Church folk got church. I'm after people that are outside this house that are in danger of hellfire that need Jesus. And I don't care if they're gearheads or cowboys or, or heathen or in bars. I don't care. Just folk need Jesus. You got friends that need Jesus. Amen. They need this house. They need this house. They need the other churches in this community. We need to go after people again. Can I get an amen? Amen. Somebody smarter than me, reach back here and bump that AC up just a little bit till folk get cold. Thank you. I say bump it down. You just keep your, you got your blanket. You're good. You can come, come prepare. Joshua chapter 6, amen, verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came out. The Israelites, almost 2 million of them, 
a camp next to the Jordan River. Across the Jordan stands the city of Jericho. Now I know I've jumped way ahead. But now you've got Joshua fixing going to the promised land. He's staring at the Jordan. The scripture says they lifted up the, the Ark of the Covenant. When the priests put their feet in the water, the water parted just like the Red Sea. They parted, got over on the other side, and there was Jericho. The, I can go through some more stuff here. Did all the men get circumcised? Ooh. As a baby, that didn't hurt. As a grown man, that's painful. All the men, two, two million men circumcised they just stacked all that up on on a hill just stacked it up the men were hollering i bet when jericho heard them men screaming ah! <laughs> all of jericho just shook because they're scared now because they never heard a scream like that before amen the walls listen about jericho i won't tell you about the city jericho was an eight acre city this is five acres go eight acres the wall was double, two walls being about 15 feet apart. The houses were built between them. They were 40 foot high, high as our tower out at the ranch, 66 feet wide. That's like a six-lane highway. That's how thick these walls was. So, Kenny, you got two walls like a freeway. You got houses built in the middle. Then you got a city in the middle. Then you got a lady by the name of Rahab. She's up in the house, amen, and she's already heard the reports of how tough these Israelites are. She's already heard the screams as they're coming over. She hid two spies, two spies. But now, their names, I won't even go into that right now. She hid two spies. Joshua was smart. Let me tell you how smart Joshua was. When Moses sent spies over the promised land, how many did he send? Come on, church. Twelve. He sent 12 spies over. Two men came back and said, we can take the land. Uh, who were they? They were Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 men are recorded in the Bible. You don't know their name because we do not set up or erect statues for people that want to fail. We don't do it. But we all name our kids Joshua and Caleb. I, every, I mean more Joshua and Caleb's in churches than any other places in the whole world. Everybody want to name their kids Joshua and Caleb. Caleb and Joshua. They, they're the great names. They're, they're, give me this mountain. Now, 40 years later, they get to the edge of the promise and all them others have died off. When they get there, they're ready to take over Jericho. Joshua says, I'm sending two spies. I ain't sending 12. When you get 12, when you get a jury of 12, it's hard to get them to agree on one thing. But if I can get two guys to go over there, I can get them to agree. They slip over there and they find, I don't know how they found it, but instead of going to the church, the temple, instead of going to the blacksmith shop, these two lonely dudes said, look, there's a red light over that house. Let's go to that house. So they go to this house, and her name was Rahab, and even in the New Testament, it's still recorded, Rahab the prostitute. Now, do I need to interpret prostitute? Do y'all know enough Bible to know what that means? Okay, all right, so we're good there. So now, they go to her house, and she hid the spies. They knew there were spies in the place, but they couldn't find them. If she were being discovered, she'd probably be killed. But she was afraid of someone else more than she was afraid of death. She feared the Lord. She said to the spies, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. There are people outside these walls that know that God is God. There are people outside these walls that walk in, the, in a worldly way, like prostitutes and drunkards and, and addictions and all kind of stuff, that know that God is God. They know it. They just don't, haven't met you yet. They haven't met somebody that can bring them to the cross yet. They had not met somebody that can introduce them to the God they're afraid of. Amen. And that's your place in this life. Rahab was risking her life and sheltering them and, and she asked their mercy when the Israelites would march into Jericho and she said I want you to save my family and they said to her you need to stay in the house everybody say the house Home, sweet home. You need to stay at home, girl. Amen. The only way that anyone in this city of Jericho was going to be saved was if you stay in that house. So Rahab found her family, and she brought them into the house with her because she wanted to be saved, and she wanted her family. Now, she's affecting her whole family. Her faith affected her family. So does yours. So to refuse to come into the house was to bring death and destruction on yourself. I'm telling you, there's security in the house. There's protection in the house because there's danger outside. It could have cost their lives. If you want to be 
be safe, stay in the house. For Rahab and her family, stay there. Joshua chapter 2, verse 17. Now the men who had said to her, this oath you made us swear not, is, is not, will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. Get all your family into your house. And if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their heads. We will not be responsible. For as those who are in the house with, the, you, with you, their blood will be on their head. Amen. If only, shoot, just a lot of stuff here. If a hand is laid on them on the seventh day, you know what they did. Those Israelites marched around that city for six days. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times around. And they said not a word. First miracle. Nobody talked. I can't even preach a whole service without somebody in here talking. Seven times around that city. They marched. They don't know what's going to happen. They know the Jordan just split. They're probably all, all the men are probably still a little sore. They're still marching around that city. They ain't saying a word. And God said, on the 13th time, when you get around that city, on the seventh day, whole week's passed, they've laid siege to it. And every time they went around that city, they looked and they saw a room with a scarlet cord hanging out of it. A red cord. I can't imagine that when this was introduced, that Rahab herself was dressed all in red. Natalia, would you stand? <laughs> right, no, just, no, 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 you, you, you can sit right here. I'm just saying, just, I just think you're so beautiful today. <laughs> she didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> But I saw her dressed in red, and I thought to myself, I bet you Rahab was dressed all in red. I bet everybody in that house had red on. Amen. I bet everybody was wanting to, we want you to know we got the red. Amen. We got the blood on us. Can I get an amen? Amen. And there's power in the blood. So she, that right there, and, with, and then the warning, without warning, the trumpets blast. 600,000 voices scream all at once. The ground shakes. The walls of the city crash to the ground. And through the dust, they see the screaming soldiers running straight into the city with their swords swinging. Blood splatters, pools on the ground. Then person after person falls lifeless to the ground. Then comes the fire destroying the city and everything in it. But one section of the wall, one section of the wall never fell. One small section of the wall stood there with a house sitting on top of it. Inside that house was a woman who wanted to be saved with her whole family inside. Inside that house was a group of people who trusted in God's promise. Say it with me, home sweet home. Amen. She stayed in there. You can imagine the rattle. Just like what happened in Houston this week with that wind blowing through and everything shaking. Some of you ran to the middle of your house and you hit down in the closet. Amen. Things are happening all around you. We've had it before. If you've lived here any time at all, you've dealt with a hurricane. Amen. And all that shaking going on. Hallelujah. And she stayed in the house. Let me tell you something. The city of Houston, southeast Texas, not just Texas, this, the, our nation right now is being shaken. There are things going on in our nation right now that will blow your mind if you're able to open your eyes. All outside the house, there are things that are happening. Politically, it's happening. Outside the house, physically, it's happening. Spiritually, it's happening. God is shaking some things right now. I told my pastor the other day, I said, there's a lot of people that prayed this week and ain't prayed in a long time. Amen. They got hold of God when the storms went through here. Hallelujah. The floods were one thing, but get the wind up and the wind will start splattering. Hallelujah. Things start happening. Stay in the house. I can imagine that scene and the screaming and the hollering and the wanting to go out. There's a curiosity among us. We want to go outside and look. We'll get our phone and go out there and video. See, we can catch a tornado coming right at us like an idiot. So we can be popular on YouTube. Chapter 6, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. 
So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and her mother, her brothers and her sisters, and all who had belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. What made that house different? That scarlet cord, that oath they made, the blood, if you would. And Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her. Amen. The scripture said then, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. One house was spared. One house. And that whole city, that great city that fell. Historically, Jericho fell into the ground. Literally, God <laughs> sucked it down into the ground. Amen. It was like an elevator going down. In one house stood. And it was Rahab's. Amen. It stayed right there. That scarlet line was more than a token for Rahab's household. It's a type of the blood of Christ. A scarlet line that runs through all the scripture. Amen. From the time animals were killed to clothe Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden, the shedding of blood is a type of remission of sin. Our salvation was covered by the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's why I stay in the house. When I apply this, the book of Romans tells me in chapter 15, verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So when I go to the Old Testament, everything inside this book in the Old Testament was written to teach me something. I look at that. So that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provided, we might have hope. So I look to it to see hope. And I'm telling you, this red cord, even when I walk in my house now, 2020, I put a red scarlet cord over my door. Amen. Right? Remind me that I, I'm under the blood. And I walk under that thing now, and it's got cobwebs on it and little, little creatures hanging on it that are dead. And I think, I need to get that off and wash it. But I really don't want to touch it. Amen. Because the red's over my door. I just want to keep the red over my door. It, it's, you say, well, it's just cloth. You know, I went down to see Pastor Rick, and I handed him a bandana. Not any bandana. Sherman, it was a purple bandana. That boy from Baton Rouge. I can't bring him a red one. Amen. He might reject crimson. But he'd take a purple one. And I watched him, and he held, and he clinged onto that, that bandana. And he said, well, ain't no, ain't no. But I read Scripture that if I can believe God for something, sometimes I, I will leave a place, almost every place I've ever left. When I left the old Crosby Motel to start the Crosby Church, I took a chair out of there. When I left a building that was over here off the freeway and moved to the new building, I brought something over there. When we, when we built a church out in New Caney, my Bible sits underneath the concrete. Amen. Everything I've done, I take something, I remind myself of a monument, something that tells me that this matters. When I give somebody a handkerchief, how many's ever received a handkerchief from me? Everybody that's ever received a handkerchief, I'm telling you something, there's no power in the handkerchief. It's our agreeing together. But it's something to hang on to to remember the miracles in our life. Can I get an amen? I promise you that cord when she got it down, she took that thing out the window. She probably made her a skirt with it or maybe a headscarf with it. She probably did something with that thing. Amen. And I can't prove this, and you can't disprove it. But if you follow this woman through Scripture, I, I'm, I'm moving to the end because I'm, I'm close. I, I ain't got time to do this whole thing. Matthew 1, we're going all the way to New Testament now. Matthew 1 says this, verse 5. This is a, called a genealogy. Simon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. So when I back up to Rahab, I realize that seed ran through this prostitute. That made it all the way to King David, which made it all the way to Mary, which produced Jesus. God hid the seed through a prostitute. And sometimes we look at people and we, we forgot what sinners we were. We forgot the wickedness we've done. We forgot the grace of God that's been on our lives. We forgot the power of the blood of Jesus and the grace of God that washes us daily. Can I get an amen? I can't prove this, but I asked myself, I wonder who married Rahab? 
and I'm going to take a wild guess, it was one of them spies. I'm going to say it like this. One of them said to the other one, I got dibs. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. When I think of this woman, Rahab, I, I see so much in her life. I see a woman, amen, and her background. She had, it, it's indiscriminate faith. When God saves you, it, he doesn't look at you and go, well, let me check your background, your pedigree, where your DNA and where you came from. No, she was a Gentile doomed for destruction. She's doomed as a Canaanite woman in a nation that's going to be destroyed. She's doomed as a prostitute because of her own personal sins. Amen. She's not an Israelite. She lives in a wicked land, but she has something that is necessary for salvation. She does not have good work but she has faith faith in God when you have faith you say God I ain't seen you yet I don't know exactly who you are but I have faith that I didn't just show up here as a blob from evolution you created me you gave me purpose in this life and I believe that one day when this earth suit dies here I'm going to go on and be with you and the rest of my family and friends I'm going to stay in the house can I get an amen amen, amen. where's my, where, where, where my musician at where he at here he come here he come here he come he doesn't have his coffee Mm -hmm. Everything she does is her acting on her faith. It's the picture of true saving faith. Faith acknowledges the Lord, submits to his requirements. She knows God is going to win. She already said it. Amen. She, I can see that little house packed, shaking, just like many of us were this week. And all I can tell you to do is when the storm hits, when that storm hit, do you know the one thing I did not do? I didn't run outside. And stand in the middle of a field and watch the trees and the rain blow all around me. Uh-uh. I brought my big dog in. And me and him sat in my man cave. <laughs> and we watched that wind. And all I thought to myself was, home sweet home. This house has endured hurricanes for 60 years. And we have to, we'll endure another one. And the worst thing this thing can do to me is take me to heaven. Stay in the house. The red blood from slain lambs that was splashed over the doorpost of the Israelite homes in Egypt protected them from the slayer of the firstborn. Exodus 12, 12 says, On that same night I will pass throughout Egypt. I'm going to strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And this was to force Pharaoh to release the children of Israel and let them free. After 400 years of slavery, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. That scarlet cord seems to symbolize in type Rahab's acceptance of the Lamb's blood in her life. Those Israelites already knew of the blood of the Lamb. They still were even sacrificing even up until that day. What the blood of the first Passover did for the Israelites may be compared to the use of the scarlet cord. When we take communion here, we remind ourselves that there was a scarlet cord that was cast for us to rescue us. So I'm going to say to you, Stay in the house. This is home, sweet home. This is a place of security and safety. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Shimei, stay in your house. Benjamites, stay in your house. When the prodigal son realized that life had turned bad, he turned and came back to the house. And he met his father. And he killed a calf and had a party and a celebration. When people come back to the house, to me in my spirit, there's celebration, there's excitement. I don't know everybody in this house, so I'm going to ask this question one more time. You were shaking this week. Things happened. You perhaps called on the God of, of the heavens just like Rahab did. She didn't know him. She knew of him. If you want to know him this morning, just put your hand up and put it back down. Just up and down real quick. Amen. I look across the building before I pray. Anyone, real quick, those watching online, stretch your hands toward your TV, your phone, your tablet, whatever it is. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we hold on to the scarlet cord. We hold on to the blood that takes away our sins, that washes us, that looks after us. And not only does it save us from the now, but it's going to save us for the later. There's protection. There's power in the blood. In Jesus' name. And everyone say Amen. Come on, give God some praise in here. As I spent time with Pastor Rick this week down at MD Anderson, I had no idea the power that's in the blood. Your blood fights infection. Your blood strengthens organs in your body. Your blood carries red and white blood cells. The red carries your oxygen so that you can breathe. And I thought to myself, when God decided I'm going to use blood, that I'm going to put blood into an empty carcass, and I'm going to breathe into the lungs and give it life, that blood, as long as there's blood, there's life. Amen. That's why even in the Old Testament, it's recorded. Don't, don't drink the blood. Don't, don't eat the blood. That, that's why, seriously, when I get ready, I know some of y'all are really big on rare steaks. I, I, like, I like it pink. But, man, if it starts to run, I'm afraid I'm going to hear it move. I don't want that. <laughs> but I don't like it. You know, well done, good and faithful servant. That's heaven. That ain't my steaks. So it's got to be somewhere in the middle there. You know what I'm saying? So as I, I, as I think about, and, I, and I, I got to keep contemplating when Pastor Rick talked to me about the blood, but the fight that goes on, the power that's in your blood, so important. Amen. That's why you should take Geritol. You need that iron in your blood, Kenny. Hallelujah. If you need a tither and offer, tither offer an envelope that's in front of you if our servant leaders would come on up. Josiah, I pray this week that you and Natalia, would you go stand with your husband, Natalia, in the beautiful red? You just, it was God that told you wear red today. Next week, we're going to pray over you too and send you out. But I pray you honor this couple this week. That you're able to do something. You stay in touch with them. You know, they're going to be in and out. Me and Joe, don't, we don't had this talk. They're going to be in and out from our house. And I do not know yet. <clears throat> I do not know about who's going to uh, be our next worship leader. For 21 years, we've only had two worship leaders. That's not bad for one church. A lot of churches have a lot of turnover. But I, in my spirit, I'm willing to come in here and sing a cappella. Some of y'all raised Church of Christ. Y'all know all about it. I just, and when you understand this book and how the church started, there was no youth pastors till 1960. They didn't have a youth. You didn't read, well, you know, Stephen was a youth pastor. No, he was stoned at 16, which a lot of y'all were stoned at 16. But when I'm reading this book, I realize that we created a lot of stuff. We created the worship atmosphere and the smoke and the, and the mirrors and all the stuff that goes with it. A lot of churches you've been watching, online, oh, we thought church was more like that. We could do that. We could do that, but it ain't us. But a lot of churches, you know, they, we, we keep trying to amp this thing up. And I thank God that we're fixing to have to hit a reset button. There was a time, how many do we have, Kenny? We had probably had three or four guitar players on the stage one time. I remember back in the day, we, when we first started, it's like they'd come out the woodwork. And boy, you talking, I mean, right out to bars. Why do you think the band was called the Baptist Bar and Grill Band? Because half the band that come out of the bars. And I don't, so I don't know what God's going to do. Uh, we're connecting. We're reaching. We're talking. As of right now, it's, it's, a, it's a blank. But I will still show up here. And I will still preach like there's 500 people in this church. I will believe God that outside these walls, people will find this house. And that you will find those people out there. Because they need to know. Amen. The walls, they are shaking. As we give today, we're believing God for. 
Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the king. Before Pastor Joseph comes, I'll, I'll just, we only have just a couple of announcements. I'll make this one here real quick. Uh, Katie, you, you have a quench class on Tuesday nights. Would you stand, Sister Katie? It's my daughter, as you know, and she, uh, she makes me look good on media. She, she made Joseph look good last week. Uh, but uh, so she will has a meeting out at the ranch Tuesday night. I think we're going to do it in the sanctuary. And our daughter Jill will be coming back from a mission trip, which you sent her to Kakakakistan. Uh, and uh, Turkey, and I got it right that time, and, and Morocco. And uh, she's been on quite an adventure. She's going to be back only for a few days. And uh, so if you'd like to come out and hear her adventure and, and missions and all the things that she is involved in, come out Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, out at the ranch. And uh, here, she's, this girl's a world traveler. Matter of fact, she'll only be here for a few days, and she's heading to England. Uh, her grandmother passed away from England, and they're going to go put her ashes over there. So if you'd like to be there Tuesday night, we'd love to have you. Any other announcements? Youth, tonight in uh, New Caney and Wednesday night here. Good, hey, young men, good to have you all here. You paid attention. I like the green shirts. They look alike. Y'all brothers? Are y'all brothers? Do, you, do all three of y'all shoot? Just you? Just you. You need to teach them. All right. Everybody needs a gun. I looked at Pastor Josh, Rick Hawkins' associate, and I said, you, you got a gun? This kid's 45 years old, lives in Oklahoma. He said, I got a rifle. I said, you ain't got a pistol? He said, no. And I said, I'll bring you one. I brought him one the next day. He looked at me like, you are serious. I said, yeah, I'm serious. And I pray to God you never have to shoot somebody. But I'd rather have it and not need it than to need it. No, God, I love Texas. Hey, anyway, Pastor Joseph, come on. All right. Well, we literally don't have that many announcements. We, we do have several things going on that you can take a picture of. Uh, one thing I will mention is that all of our camps this summer, Kids Camp, Youth Camp, Ignite Camp, they're all available online for registration. So please register your kids holywell.net slash events picture on whatever picture that you need whether it be youth you know kids camp whatever just get them registered as soon as possible i mean technically kids camp is a month away not even a month away i mean it's coming quick uh you know what a few weeks yeah so yes if you want them to have a t-shirt the deadline is before june i believe uh so make sure you go ahead and register would you stand with me pretty much all the announcements I have. Uh, you have that as well. That wasn't on my list, but it's scrolling. So, uh, A lot of different things, different ministries going on in our house. Just pay attention. We good. Or you can go back to uh, the, the board back there, and if there's a group that you're interested in, you can pull a piece of paper off, get connected with the leader, and get more information that way as well. We want you to get connected. All right, let's pray. Father, uh, we, are, um, we just thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you that we can simply bow our heads and talk to you. What a privilege that is. Uh, and thank you for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you for uh, thank you for your word that teaches us and encourages us and, and guides us and convicts us where we need it, holds us accountable where we need it, Father. Uh, you continually work on us as we progress in this life to honor you and strive to honor you with our lives, not just settle but to thrive in your presence. And I pray that we do this, uh, do that as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, have a great week.